so this is the gross appearance so very commonly the gall bladder carcinoma is just presenting as you can appreciate okay with this thickened mucosa so you can see that the wall is completely thickened over here you cannot see any mass okay and you can just see a very thickened gall bladder wall okay so this is a very thickened indurated gall bladder wall and it is very much mimicking the chronic cholecystitis so you might not be able to you know identify the the, the carcinoma even grossly during the gross examination okay the second type of uh, gross presentation as you can appreciate over here they are presenting as an exophytic mass okay there is a papillary mass over here as we can appreciate this is the gall bladder wall okay so basically usually the intra cholecystic papillary neoplasms are presenting over here or carcinomas which are arising from it can present in this particular fashion okay and sometimes the gall bladder carcinoma is presenting as a solid tan tumor with a central cavitation virtually filling the lumen and you can appreciate this is the normal gb mucosa okay and you can appreciate the tumor is presenting as a large solid tumor with central cavitation a solid tumor so this is the way in which the gall bladder carcinoma can present okay grossly so this is the microscopic feature of the most common uh, uh, histological subtype of adenocarcinoma that is the biliary type so you can appreciate over here the malignant gland so these are the malignant glands as we can appreciate over here okay so the malignant glands okay they are seen infiltrating the desmoplastic stroma so this is basically the desmoplastic stroma you can see there is excess amount of desmoplasia okay so there is a lot of desmoplasia over here desmoplasia is excessive fibrotic reactions induced by the carcinoma okay so this is the classical picture the malignant glands which are seen infiltrating the desmoplastic stroma as we can appreciate over here so this is basically the high grade bin okay as you can appreciate over here so what are the differences that you can appreciate again over here you can see the same papillary infoldings and structure can be appreciated but what is the major change that we can appreciate over here if you see very importantly if you look at the nucleus okay if you look at the nucleus there is a nuclear membrane irregularity that you can appreciate very important okay along with that we can see very complex pseudo stratification so if you look over here there is a very complex pseudo stratification the nuclear polarity is lost so some of the nucleus is up some of them is down up like that okay so this is very important to understand the loss of nuclear polarity is there there is a prominence of nucleoli as we can appreciate over here the architecture is far more complex and the nuclear stratification is present and it is far more complex not only that you will also see certain cell clusters okay very small cell clusters okay this cohesive clusters can be appreciated over here okay so this cohesive cell clusters can be appreciated in case of high grade bin so let me just uh, show you myself dr jibran amad presents to you simply pathology and today we are back with part 2 of gall bladder disorders in this lecture we are going to discuss in details about the tumors which are arising from the gall bladder so what are we going to discuss today today we are going to discuss in details about the classification of the tumors arising from the gall bladder and the extra hepatic biliary tract according to the latest fifth edition of the who then we will discuss about the benign epithelial tumors and the precursors the important ones and then finally we will uh, end by discussing about the malignant tumors mainly the gall bladder carcinoma so first let us see the basic classification who fifth edition classification of the tumors arising from the gall bladder and the extra hepatic biliary duct so there are two groups over here one is the benign epithelial tumors and the precursors another one is the malignant epithelial tumor so in the benign epithelial tumors and precursors we are having pyloric gland adenoma of the gall bladder biliary intra epithelial neoplasia intra cholecystic papillary neoplasm intra ductal papillary neoplasm of the bile duct under the malignant epithelial tumors we are having carcinoma of the gall bladder carcinoma of extra hepatic biliary duct neuroendocrine neoplasms of the gall bladder and the biliary ducts so first condition that we are going to see first we will see the benign tumors and the precursors that will be followed by the malignant tumor that is the gb carcinoma okay so the first entity that we are discussing it is the pyloric gland adenoma of the gall bladder remember it is not a precursor lesion okay it is a benign tumor of the gall bladder so grossly visible okay it is a grossly visible non invasive neoplasm of the gall bladder which is composed of uniform back to back mucinous glands arranged in a tubular configuration it often has a complex architecture the glands they are very bland looking pyloric or brunner's gland type there is minimal cytological atypia in most of the lesions 
the foci of high grade dysplasia can be seen in larger specimen if the size is more than 1 cm okay and if dysplasia is also present then the diagnosis should be as intracholecystic papillary neoplasm and not as a pyloric adenoma okay around 50 to 60% of the cases are associated with cholelithiasis the mutational profile of pyloric gland adenoma is very different from gall bladder carcinoma the mutation now pga it shows mutation in the ctnn b1 gene which is present in 60% of the cases of uh, pyloric gland adenoma as compared to gall bladder carcinoma therefore it is hypothesized that pga it is not a precursor for gall bladder carcinoma so pga is thought to play a very minor role in gall bladder carcinoma pathogenesis not directly a precursor lesion okay immunohistochemically the pga is ck7 positive mux6 uh, positive okay uh, diffuse and strong mux6 positivity is there if invasive carcinoma is ruled out pga can be cured by surgery that is by cholecystectomy even when high grade dysplasia is present so this is all about your pyloric gland adenoma of gallbladder let us go and discuss the next entity that is the biliary intraepithelial neoplasia also called as bin or carcinoma in situ remember this is asked as a long answer question in the exam or also as an important viva question especially for the post graduate students okay so what is it it is basically a precursor lesion okay so remember this pyloric gland adenoma it is not a precursor okay whereas bin is regarded as a precursor lesion now very importantly it is a microscopic entity usually you cannot see them grossly so it is a microscopic it is a non invasive flat or micropapillary lesion it is a pre malignant lesion which is confined to the gall bladder lumen or the bile ducts okay pre malignant lesion confined to the gall bladder lumen or the bile duct okay remember it is an in situ lesion it is a carcinoma in situ lesion okay it is an incidental finding okay because it is a microscopic lesion you cannot see them visually so it is a incidental finding okay remember previously in the previous editions there was a three tier classification of bin biliary intraepithelial neoplasia 1 2 and 3 but right now in the current fifth edition of the who we are having the two tier classification of bin so bin 1 and 2 is regarded as low grade uh, 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 bin and uh, bin 3 is basically regarded as a high grade bin okay so low grade bin is having a low grade dysplasia and high grade bin is having a high grade dysplasia so the short form is lgd for low grade dysplasia and hgd hgd is for high grade dysplasia remember the low grade dysplasia is seen in 15% of the gall bladder which is having cholelithiasis whereas the high grade dysplasia is seen in even lesser amount in 1 to 3.5% gall bladder with cholelithiasis okay the bin is often encountered in the mucosa which is adjacent to the invasive carcinoma and it is present in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis primary scler uh, sclerosing cholangitis as well as polydocal cyst okay so remember what are the risk factors the risk factors basically remember one thing that the risk factors for biliary intraepithelial neoplasia includes familial adenomatous polyposis primary sclerosing cholangitis polydocal cyst and anomalous union of pancreato biliary ducts okay these risk factors are also risk factors for invasive carcinoma and always remember this is acting as a precursor lesion to the invasive carcinoma of the gall bladder that is why bin is often encountered very close to the invasive carcinoma lesion okay very important looking at the pathogenesis remember chronic biliary inflammation may induce neoplastic change of the biliary epithelium kros mutation is present in 40% cases of bin and it is an early event whereas tp53 mutation it is a late molecular event So if you look at the biliary intraepithelial neoplasia if you look there are two types okay that is low grade bin and we are having a high grade bin so we are having two types we are having a low grade bin we are having a high grade bin as i have already elucidated low grade bin incorporates the previous entity bin 1 and 2 whereas high grade bin is incorporating the previous entity bin 3 and remember under the ajcc 8th edition staging it is incorporated under carcinoma in situ now as we can appreciate if you look over here i am just going to highlight the basic differences between the two so if you can appreciate this is the low grade bin okay so very important the first important thing that we have to understand over here in the low grade bin that the epithelium it is basically thrown into small papillary foldings as we can appreciate over here 
okay very importantly if you see this area okay there is some amount of pseudo stratification that we can appreciate so nuclear pseudo stratification can be appreciated over here secondly we can see the columnar cells only which are basically lining and the nucleus if you see they are large and hyperchromatic in nature very very important findings okay so these are very important findings that you see in low grade bin okay so if you look at the basic features of the low grade bin if you look at the histology of the low grade bin basically they are flat pseudo papillary or micro papillary in nature they show hyperchromatic nuclei the nc ratio is high nuclear stratification is seen as i have shown you and very importantly one important feature that i want to show you the polarity of the nucleus if you see over here the polarity of the nucleus is maintained okay what do you mean by the polarity that means all the nucleus they are basal in lo location majority of them not all of them but majority they are basal in location so if you see over here the polarity of the nucleus is maintained over here in case of low grade bin but if you compare with the high grade bin okay if we compare with the high grade bin so this is basically the high grade bin okay as you can appreciate over here so what are the differences that you can appreciate again over here you can see the same papillary infoldings and structure can be appreciated but what is the major change that we can appreciate over here if you see very importantly if you look at the nucleus okay if you look at the nucleus there is a nuclear membrane irregularity that you can appreciate very important okay along with that we can see very complex pseudo stratification so if you look over here there is a very complex pseudo stratification the nuclear polarity is lost so some of the nucleus is up some of them is down up like that okay so this is very important to understand the loss of nuclear polarity is there there is a prominence of nucleoli as we can appreciate over here the architecture is far more complex and the nuclear stratification is present and it is far more complex not only that you will also see certain cell clusters okay very small cell clusters okay this cohesive clusters can be appreciated over here okay so this cohesive cell clusters can be appreciated in case of high grid bin so let me just uh, show you yes let me just show you over here so what are the differences so in case of high grid bin in case of high grid bin that we can appreciate over here okay in case of high grid bin okay basically the same uh, architecture is there that is the histology if you see there is a flat only the everything is same over here the other important thing that we can see in addition to the hyperchromatic nucleus there is nuclear membrane irregularity that we have appreciated already in addition to high nc ratio you have pleomorphic bizarre nucleus so you can appreciate okay the nucleus if you compare with the low grid bin it is quite pleomorphic and it is quite bizarre in nature as we can appreciate just look at the individual uh, nucleus okay so they are quite bizarre okay they are quite bizarre and they are pleomorphic in nature okay then nuclear stratification is also present in high grid and it is more complex compared to the low grid bin and very importantly the nuclear polarity is preserved all the nucleus they are basal but over here some nucleus is up some is down so there is loss of nuclear polarity that we can see and in addition you can see budding cell clusters can be appreciated so as i already told you such budding cell clusters they can be appreciated over here okay now if you look at the biliary so this was all the differences with regards to the histology that we have discussed secondly if you look at the biliary mucosa involvement there is a relatively small area involved but over here relatively larger area is involved involvement of the glands which are surrounding the biliary epithelium so involvement of the peribiliary glands it is infrequent in case of low grade bin whereas it is frequent over here the ki67 proliferation rate it is mild to moderately raised whereas over here it is markedly increased if you compare the immunohistochemistry s100 if you see it is mild to moderately increased okay s100 positivity is only mild to moderately increased whereas there is diffuse strong positivity of s100 in high grade bin p53 staining is usually negative whereas they are frequently positive in high grade bin and p16 staining is relatively preserved in low grain low grade bin whereas it is reduced or it is decreased staining of p16 is seen mainly in case of high grade bin so grossly if you see grossly if you see basically over here bin lesions are usually they are not grossly visible but they may be associated with mucosal thickening so bin lesions are usually not grossly visible but they may be associated with mucosal thickening if you look at the prognosis of bin most of the high grade bin they are cured by surgery but few after many years okay they can have recurrence as well as metastasis 
सो वॉट आर दी एडिशनल रिस्क ऑफ रिकरेंस एक्सटेंसिव डिजीज इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ रॉकेटैंस की एस्टॉपाइनस एंड मार्जिन पॉजिटिविटी ऑल ऑफ दीज आर एडिशनल रिस्क ऑफ रेकरेंस ऑफ बिन ओके सो दिस वॉज वन ऑफ द प्री मैलिग्नेंट लीजन टू गोल ब्लैडर कार्सोनोमा दैट इज द बिन दैट वी हैव रेड एंड इट वॉज अंडर दी हेडिंग ऑफ बिनाइन एपिथिलियल लीजन एंड द प्रिकर्स the next important precursor lesion that we will read and again this is a very important favorite examiner question so they can be asked again as a long answer question or again a viva question in your exam that what is an intracholecystic papillary neoplasm so what is the difference from bin if you see that these are grossly visible lesions they are mass forming they are non invasive epithelial neoplasm which is arising in the mucosa and which is projecting into the lumen of the gall bladder and sometimes even it is filling up the lumen of the gall bladder if there is a component of invasive carcinoma the lesion is called intracholecystic papillary neoplasm with associated invasive carcinoma it is very much like the pancreatic mucinous neoplasms that we had seen okay now it is this this lesion is very much similar to the pancreatic intraductal papillary mucosal neoplasm usually the size is more than equal to 1 cm and microscopically they can have different types of architecture including papillary architecture tubular architecture or a mixed tubular papillary architecture there are four important morphological patterns okay of intracholecystic papillary neoplasm the most common is biliary which is the most common they show lining by the cuboidal cells and they are ck7 and mac1 positive then the gastric variety which is lined by gastric foveolar type of cells and they are mac5 ac positive then we have the intestinal variety which is lined by tall columnar cells and they are diffuse strong positivity for cdx2 and ck20 as seen and they are mac2 positive the oncocytic variety is the least common variety which is mac1 ma positive now we will look at the high grade and the low grade dysplasia so on the basis of the degree of dysplasia that is present so basically the intracholecystic papillary neoplasm they can be defined as high grade and low grade so the high grade one is showing loss of polarity with nuclear pleomorphism whereas the low grade variety shows only mild to moderate atypia so this is most commonly seen in women 50% of the cases are presenting with right upper quadrant pain in the abdomen rest cases are incidental now 6% of the gall bladder carcinoma they are associated with intracholecystic papillary neoplasm suggesting that it is basically a precursor or a pre malignant lesion Kros mutation is quite common over here. TP53 and and Ganas mutation, which is more common in the pancreatic intraductal neoplasm, it is very rare in case of intracholecystic pancreatic uh, uh, intracholecystic papillary neoplasm. Looking at the prognosis, if you see ICPNs without any associated carcinomas, they have a very good prognosis after surgery. So intracholecystic papillary neoplasm without any associated carcinoma have a very good prognosis after surgery, and the five-year uh, 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 survival rate without the carcinoma is seventy-eight percent. Whereas the five-year survival rate, if there is an associated cancer, it is around sixty percent. But remember, even if the ICPNs are associated with carcinoma, their prognosis is better than the usual conventional gall bladder carcinoma. remember icpn with carcinoma has a better prognosis compared with the conventional gall bladder carcinoma which is the next topic of discussion so apart from this so these were all the benign and the pre malignant lesion now we are going to discuss basically in details about the carcinoma of the gall bladder okay so about the carcinoma of the gall bladder remember this is asked very frequently as a long answer question again it is asked during your viva during the grossing viva gall bladder specimen might be kept and all the related questions might be asked so pay a lot of attention over here it is the most common malignancy of the extra hepatic biliary tract it is a malignant epithelial neoplasm arising in the gall bladder from the biliary epithelium and the essential criteria is that it should at least invade the lamina propria of the gall bladder what is the most common site of gall bladder carcinoma it is the fundus in 60% of the cases this is the most common site okay the next most common is the body involving 30% of the cases and next is the neck involvement 10% of the cases most of the tumors they are flat the clinical features are often indistinguishable from cholelithiasis okay a uh, uh, right upper quadrant pain is quite common and more than 50% of the cases are diagnosed incidentally more than 50% of the cases are diagnosed incidentally increased uh, incidence of gall bladder carcinoma is seen in chile and in india 
wherein the incidence is far more in case of female as compared to male okay very very important and they are associated with gallstones whereas in case of eastern asia the incidence between male and female is almost equal and there is no association with gallstone increased incidence is also seen in certain central and eastern european country now what are the etiological factors or the risk factors of gallbladder carcinoma so gallstones are the most common risk factors which are present in 95% of the patient the second important risk factor is psc that is primary sclerosing cholangitis then aflatoxin b1 salmonella typhi that is basically infection so remember one thing chronic bacterial or parasitic infections are risk factors as well as gallstone because the, the the common factor between both the gallstones as well as salmonella typhi or any kind of infections is the presence of chronic inflammation then pancreato biliary maljunction so what happens in case of pancreato biliary maljunction the supraorderi uh, uh, union of cbd with the main pancreatic duct occurs which is allowing the pancreatic juice to enter the gall bladder and which stimulates mucosal hyperplasia then uh, other risk factors include familial carcinoma syndromes like familial adenomatous polyposis as well as lynch syndrome so majority of the patients diagnosed are diagnosed in advanced stage and in surgically undetectable stage therefore the mean five year survival is very bad it is less than 10% okay so any of the causes okay whether it be presence of gallstones or chronic bacterial or parasitic infections or metabolic syndrome any of these factors they induce chronic inflammation and you know that chronic inflammation in the long run is a uh, very fertile land for carcinoma development okay other risk factors include hyaluronizing polycystitis okay which is also called as incomplete porcelain gallbladder as you remember this is again a risk factor for gb carcinoma okay then certain genetic mutation also predisposes for example more than 50% of the gallbladder carcinoma is harboring tp53 alteration other molecular alterations include cdk n2a or cdk n2ba molecular alteration in 19% of the case arid 1a mutation in 13% of the case pic 3 ca mutation in 10% 10% of the case ctnn b1 in only 10% of the case okay is only 10% of the case whereas in pyloric uh, glandular adenoma it was present in 60% of the case therefore the molecular uh, profile of pyloric gland adenoma is very much different as compared to the gall bladder carcinoma erbb2 uh, mutation present in 16% that is basically the hard to okay it is the hard to mu mutation now remember long standing cholelithiasis as well as cholecystitis is leading to metaplasia in the gall bladder mucosa Uh, 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 which is followed by epithelial dysplasia and carcinoma in situ which over a long period of time gives rise to gall bladder carcinoma and this entire process is very long taking it takes approximately 15 years of age coming to the morphological appearance the macroscopic appearance very very important 70% they are arising in the fundus of the gall bladder usually usually they can you are usually very flat firm wide gritty grander poorly defined lesion they are growing diffusely and while you know even in the radiological studies or during uh, operation or during post operative care when you are doing the grossing even in that situation you might miss the gall bladder carcinoma completely okay so it is very much difficult to distinguish the carcinoma from chronic polycystitis either pre operatively operatively or post operative in the grossing now some of the tumors they are frank in nature and frank tumors they show thickened and indurated gall bladder wall okay sometimes uh, they will have exophytic or polypoid friable mucosal lesion which is very much like the intra cholecystic papillary neoplasm and the tumors which are arising from the icpn or the intra cholecystic papillary neoplasm can grow as an exophytic or a polypoid friable mucosal mass sometime you will see mucinous tumors which has a gelatinous appearance whereas the sarcomatoid and the undifferentiated tumors they present with polypoid uh, uh, with fleshy appearance So this is the